Okay, and we're back. Howdy. I think we're back. Hey. Okay, so just before the break, we were discussing... I, I just made some really amazing point that I don't actually recall. <laughs> uh, I think I was just saying that success is internally motivated, actually. Yeah. And you, were and you had a devil's avocado. External measures of success are not permanent, that they're only temporary, and that's why they don't matter. So... Uh, I don't think I... Well, okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Devil's avocado, and this is some spicy guacamole. That's what I'm... That's what I'm <laughs> oh, about. I love guacamole. I love it. This is... Well, you're about... Because you're about to get some. You're about to get some, Justin. All right. Throw it at me. Let's let's go. Okay, with some corn chips in it. Watch, you know, wear some Ooh. goggles, because you might get some in your eyes, <laughs> and it'll hurt, because it's spicy, and there's wow. sharp corn chips in it. This is the best metaphor. I'm I'm hungry. I'm so glad that you like it. <laughs> I am so glad. Okay, so I'm Devil's so Avocado. Hungry. Okay. Devil's Avocado yes. coming at you right now. I definitely haven't forgotten. Whoa! Whoa. And I'm not just stalling uh. so that I can remember what it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I really haven't forgotten it. Um, so my Devil's Avocado is, why don't you just teach your your uh, what are we calling uh your listeners disciples um <laughs> i don't think i'd call it that yeah i think i like like cult <laughs> cult, vic cult victims what's a what, what would you call twi twin heads two heads two nights two nights the justified what would you what the you justified oh that sounds biblical yeah, it do well, I'm trying to make you sound more like a cult. So I I got those references when you use the word cult. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just going to say the word cult as many times as possible. And <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Anyway, so why don't you just teach your listeners to whatever whatever state that they're in in their lives? Why don't mm -hmm. they just personally define that for themselves as success, and then not worry about anything and not change anything? I'm really glad you brought that up. I Devil's had a avocado remarkable explosion. <laughs> yeah. Bur uh, I wonder if I can make a real explosion. Let me try. I'm gonna make a real explosion sound effect here. That is. Was that, that good? Makes me so happy that you've included a cheesy sound effect in the show. <laughs> I made that. I made that sound. I, I'm gonna like sound bite that. I'm so happy. I am like amazingly. <laughs> Because I'm remembering from our previous conversation. Okay, so I actually was in a remarkable conversation with a friend of mine earlier today. Literally remarkable because I am remarking on it right now. So it is remarkable. Wordplay. Wordplay. It's, that's, a, that's, that's my extent of my sense of humor today. So it was remarkable. Um, I was discussing the notion of complete, feeling complete. And I certainly could talk more about that but to the the real focus of it was exactly your question um uh, she'd said well what's the point in getting better at anything if you're happy with where you are that was that was kind of her question which i think is a similar one to yours i mean why not just redefine what makes me happy so that i can be happy where i am yeah or redefine what what is successful so that i can be successful and therefore right. not worry about right. not being you know a professional dancer um 24 7 and instead being a brilliant guru so the the first thing that i'd like to say is when i say that anything is possible which i realize for you you may not actually believe anything is possible no i, don't. I may right now when i say anything is possible what I mean by that is you have to redefine what's possible in order to do that. You have to expand your definitions of what is and what could be. And, you know, if you're to be specific and say, I'm going to be a professional dancer in the traditional sense, like I'm going to be a performer on a stage with thousands of people watching me and paying money for me to just be a dancer of a professional company as well as a motivational speaker 
in the traditional sense that I'm speaking in front of a crowd of people who are paying to just watch me speak, and that's it. I'm not going to dance. I'm going to have those two isolated, separate things. I'm using myself as the example. Uh, yeah. You might say that that's not possible. Mm. And and what I encourage in in my work, in my methods, uh, when I speak with people is possible is infinite. That's one of my expressions. I say possible is infinite. And I do believe anything is possible. But you need to figure out how. How do you make that reality possible? It would be possible to do those two things. You would have to make some sacrifices. But it would be possible to do those two things. I've chosen because I want to have other things in my life. And I was having this difficulty in resolution. I've chosen to redefine what being a professional dancer is because in the end I had to make a choice I had to either become a you know I only had so many hours in a week I could commit to, to being a professional so I chose rather than redefining what a motivational speaker was I chose to redefine what a professional dancer was okay but uh, so what you've said was that you needed to make some sacrifices right uh, I wouldn't call that a, a sacrifice. What I realize, well, I'm, literally, um, I'm literally quoting you from like a couple of seconds ago. Okay, I I, I mean, well, okay, I'll go with that. Sure. Um. So you you said that you needed to make some you need to make some sacrifices, or you needed to make some sacrifices. I think um, I said the word choice. I thought that's what I said. You definitely said the word sacrifices. You definitely. Okay. Yeah, and, and and the concept of that is very similar to, to what I've sort of been harping on about in that yeah. um, I'm feeling like sometimes really crappy about the fact that I know that I've had to basically switch off a couple of burners and say to myself, mm. like, this is not going to be my path. This is not going to be my journey. I'm not going to be mm -hmm. a singer. I'm not going to be a comedian. I'm not going to mm -hmm. be an astronaut i'm i'm going mm -hmm. to be whatever it is i'm going to be um mm -hmm. and and that's sometimes a really sad thought for me and and yeah. i agree with you like i do need to redefine for myself that you know success is being really good at this thing that i've chosen to do um mm -hmm. and that's all well and good but it still gets me down a bit sometimes that i'm not going to be any of those other things um, something that I'd like to encourage, though, is my, my, I would say right now, my fame as a dancer is about equal as my fame as a motivational speaker, that I'm known for both among my closest friends and family and to the odd, odd or one or two strangers. Right. So, so in other so, words, you have no fame in, in either of those things. Well... Essentially, I mean, if you were to make fame, you know, I'm known by a million people. No, I'm not known by a million people. A uh, hundred thousand people? I don't think I'm known by a hundred thousand people. Somewhere less than that. I don't know how to quantify it objectively. It would be mm -hmm. just a feeling be lower than that. But that's the limit of my of my fame in both fields because socially i uh, whenever given the chance as you you know uh, i dance and professionally i speak and right now those two realms are about equal but like i said success is to me defined by your level of contentment with those areas so although you may not be a professional say singer or artist or astronaut perhaps you can be content with the level of astronauting or singing or <laughs> artisting that you do have in your life and it's the same with family or relationships uh, contentment is not measured to me by what I have achieved or what I've done, or what I have in my life. Contentment comes from who I am. And I can tell you, I'm extremely content with my life. I'm very happy as a motivational speaker. I'm very happy if you and I were the only two people in this conversation, and we're the only two people who listen, I would be very happy with that. I think that that's great. And I think mm -hmm. that that's a wonderful perspective. I mm -hmm. don't think that that is something that a lot of your listeners will share with you. It's something that mm. I don't feel I share with you. Like, mm -hmm. 
um, you know, as a as a performer, um, a, a lot of a lot of being a performer is you know wanting to wanting to do stuff, but then wanting other people to consume the stuff that you um, certainly you have to give. And a lot of things about being a motivational speaker um, uh, is is about people being impacted positively by the things that you have to say. And yep. no no amount of defining for yourself whether you know it's successful if just one person tunes in and it changes for them will mm-hmm. will make you. Um, you know, as much as there isn't an objective measure of success, like you've said, it's about being uh, satisfied in and of yourself. Yeah. It's still, it's still something that you've maybe convinced yourself of. It's maybe something mm-hmm. that that you believe because it's comfortable for you to believe that. And so, that what you're suggesting really is that on a personal oh. level. So, what you're suggesting is. That my argument is that uh, if you're unhappy, redefine what makes you happy so you can be happy. And what you're saying is, if you're unhappy, you're unhappy, and there's uh, because you're missing thing one thing. You're choosing X over Y, and although having X and Y would make you happy, you feel like you've only had to choose X. Yeah. And losing Y makes you unhappy. Yeah, and it's okay. It's okay to feel that way. And it's a normal well, sure. I mean, it's it's, it's certainly feeling. okay. It's certainly okay to make the choice between one of two things. What I'm suggesting, though, is to create a possibility in your life to integrate that other thing. I'll give you an example. A friend of mine, she's a remarkably talented actress. Her training in school was in psychology, but she's a remarkably talented actress. She's a very talented director of local theater plays. And I've sat down with her for dinner a few times, and we've discussed her work and what she does. And I'm I'm deeply moved by her performances. She's really great uh, when I've watched her perform. And yet her full-time occupation is in the insurance business. Her career and her passion are two totally separate worlds. Now, she also has time for family, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially, she does community theater. And I asked her, I said, why do you pursue this career? I mean, she likes her work. It's not like it. she's like super passionate. The company itself is really great. She enjoys the company. She enjoys her work. She does feel like she's making the world a better place. But I, I sometimes wonder if she was offered an opportunity full-time doing theater, if she would choose that. And I asked her, so why don't you pursue theater as your passion and career? Why don't you put the two together? And her answer was, the pressure... It's about insurance. Perhaps. I mean, what her answer was, the pressure of doing it for money was uh, at one point, I think either she had tried it or had not, I'm not sure. But the pressure of it being a job she felt was going to take the fun away from her ability to enjoy the work. So she still writes, produces, directs, and acts. She still does those things. But she does. She works at her job in a way that she can leave her work and not have to take it with her. It's not like she has homework. And she specifically found a job where she could do that. And she's able to enjoy her passion in a way that she is performing for others at a level that she feels content with. She's happy performing for the 20 or 30 or 200 people. I think that's a brilliant example, Justin. And, and I totally agree with you. I think that that's a, a wonderful example of like tempering what you see as contentment or success from a, from a pursuit and turning something that could be potentially a career into a really satisfying hobby. But mm-hmm. I, th- I think my only, my only like, uh, you know, second minor devil's avocado, like a spoon, just a s- small spoon of avocado. Um, would, it, would it be like, would it be like, a, like, a, like almost a, a dust of avocado, like a, like a sprinkling of it? Like if we de- dehydrated it and dried it up and then ground it into a fine powder and then sprinkled it on? I feel like that, that kind of devil's avocado the joy of a nice creamy buttery avocado. I think what more I, I, I agree. I think like I'll you, say, agree with you, you go to like a taco place and 
they give you like a small little pot, like a plastic mm. little pot of avocado, and yeah. you've paid about two bucks for it, and it's a bit of a rip off, but you really want to add some avocado, and they've made you pay extra for it. It's more like that amount of avocado. When you put it that way, it, it makes me never want to buy avocado on the side to just go and buy an avocado. Yeah, you should just you should just have an avocado in your pocket all the time and add it to things. Uh, yeah, like you honestly, you would save so much money. I probably just you probably just saved me a hundred dollars right now. I, I think I did, and I and I think that if that is the one thing that comes out of today's show, then we have been successful, and that is something <laughs> to be really happy about. But yes, right, and we'll feel content. <laughs> so small, a small spoon of avocado. If, uh, if a great Canadian director, I know none, but if a great Canadian director uh, came up to her and was like, uh, be in my movie, I will make you a star, um, would she drop her insurance job? I don't know. Would she, I know that she for her, family is very her important. Childhood dream of being an insurer and go yeah. and pursue this... Uh, this down-to-earth, stable employment in in theater or film? Well, I think her... I don't think insurance was her passion. I think family oh, I is the most important thing sarcastic. for her. I thought so. I just like being serious because I feel like it is the the antithesis of sarcasm, is seriousness. Yeah, yeah. You are, you are the rock upon which we all... I can't. I can't finish my metaphor. I have nothing. I have nothing. To <laughs> I. <laughs> it's a Saturday for you. Why? Why should you? Feel, why should you have anything? I feel like an avocado that had all of my buttery inside squeezed out. Like it's just the rind. You're the avocado skin. Yeah. It's. <laughs> oh, so many avocado. I really. I have an avocado in my fridge. I'm going to enjoy one after the show. Oh my god! Yum. I'm really looking forward yeah. to some avocado. I bought some over, like underripe avocados uh, about Ooh. a week ago, and I'm hoping that they're about ripe now, so I can oh, good. I can t- partake in them. So, getting back to to this situation, uh, I believe family was really important for her, and so it wasn't just about having a job; it was about having a job in the same city as her family, because being distant was unacceptable for her. Yep. And she found a job where she's happy enough with the work and the environment that, you know, she does it, leaves it, and then gets to spend her time with her family and her passion. So, so, I, so is your message mm-hmm. to the justified um, happy enough is as good as happy? Well, I think that's a great, that's a great point. I, you know, I, when I said that, I realized as I was saying it, I'm like, ooh, happy enough. Why did you say that way? Well, let, well, me, let me clarify. I'm here to be an asshole to you, Justin. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that you hold me accountable to my words. It's, it's so pl- pleasing for me. I'm very, I, if, if you're watching the stream still, you'll see me giggle after you say things like that. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> he's right. So, I'm glad I could have that way. Yeah. <laughs> So, what what I would say is this: in in a sense, happy enough is happy. You decide when you are content. You decide when you reach the level of satisfaction in your life. And going back to this opportunity lost, when you know when you make a choice. What I, what I tell people, because a lot of what we're talking about is decision making and choices and how do I make a choice between A or B or C or D. What, I, what I'm saying is, one, expand your choices. Expand what you think is available to you because it's not necessarily go for A or go for B. Sometimes you can create an alternate world, C. And I use myself as an example. I use this, this girl with uh, you know, pursuing her passion as a, as a hobby. And many people recommend that, pursuing your passions as hobbies, which is why on the compass of my suggestion, passion is its own compass. I'm lucky because my passion and my career are the same. And 
as such, I am enthralled by it. But dancing is also a passion. And that really doesn't fit in my career. I found a way to integrate it into my career a little Just bit so I have some time. I don't, yeah. I don't know if you've heard of this guy, but he was, he was around like in the maybe mid-1900s. And mm -hmm. his, um, his last name was like Einstein or something. And he basically okay, yeah. said, follow your passion and you'll never work a day in your life. Yes. Yeah. He said that. Was that Einstein that said that? Yeah, Einstein. Einstein. Is that how you pronounce it? Ein, ein, Einstein. Einstein. He he was he was German in descent, if I remember. He's a, he's like a scientist or something. Like, like I think he had like a really lame first name, like like Filbert or Albert. I think it was Albert. Is that does that sound right? Albo, Albo, Albo Einstein. Yeah, that sounds about right. Choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. Okay, that's what someone said. Good reads. I, I, I do the, uh, okay, apparently it was not Einstein that said this. Just really? for the record. I, I, I'll, I, I, I'm going to have to do some serious research. When I wrote my book, I did a lot of research into quotes, and it is very common to misquote people. So what Goodreads.com says, okay, that's my source, Goodreads.com, is that this, this guy, and it sounds like a word in English, but it's not. It's his name, Confucius. <laughs> I guess he said it. Confucius said it. According to Goodreads.com. Um, well, I'm not. I, I cannot confirm. I will. I will find an actual published place, and I'll get back to you on, on whether it was him or not. My work clearly has been lying to me. You know, I, um, there are some people in history who are continually misquoted. Einstein is one of them. Confucius is another. <laughs> Some of them are just colloquial expressions that they attach to a person's face. Isn't, wasn't it Einstein that said, misquote me and you have misquoted me? It's really deep. <laughs> Think about that. Think about it. Uh, I feel like we, I, I, I could proceed on this conversation route for a long time, but um, yes, I think if you if you pursue your passion, obviously, I, I do believe that if you if you manage to integrate your passion into your work, you, it won't feel like the negative form of work that we refer to, you know, where it's like unpleasurable and you just do it for the money and then you go home. Now, that being said, if you're not integrating your passion into your work, like my father, you know, he worked in a canning factory. Uh, they produced cans for Heinz and different companies. And I said, Dad, how was your day at work? And he said, son, I loved my work today. I got to make cans so many cans today that people will eat out of or or make food in or put food in and then make yeah, i just love i got to make so many cans today i loved my life your and dad of course is weird. He, your dad is weird if that is something that he enjoys well i think he was being facetious but uh obviously but ah, but i think so hard to read cadences and voices oh <laughs> but but the funniest thing is, uh, you know, it, it does bring an idea, that, uh, a, a quote that I'm reminded of when I was doing yoga once. If you don't like something in your life, change it. And if you don't change it, change your attitude about it. So find a way to love that which you don't. That's that's one of the one of the quotes that I've heard. It I find really motivates me and inspires me to find a way to find joy. Like I said. It, joy contentment comes from within so getting let's get back to the real topic of opportunity loss we've 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 moved on to like s success and what makes you happy and, and and whatnot but i feel like when i talk about that i'm pulling away a little bit from your original point of i'm making a choice between two things yep and how do i resolve that balance in my life i think that was your original question right yep yep it was so if if you've uh, I, I've brought in this sense of contentment that you can be content no matter what choices you make. 
and 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 that's something I'm just supposing that you can be content no matter what to, what what choices you make whether you go here and you do X or you do Y or you find some way to put X and Y together you can be happy but that still doesn't really answer how do I create some balance in my life and and what I would suppose is you can achieve a harmony between the four realms, if you will. I believe you can achieve harmony. And it, it, I believe that you can really excellently well balance. I do believe, my thesis would be, that you can achieve balance between those four areas. But I think, I think balance... And be exceptional at them. main success. Sorry? I don't think that balance necessarily means success. You can... You can sort of say, I'm happy with the amount of dancing that I'm doing because my motivational speaking is going so well that mm -hmm. the fact that I'm not a better dancer or I'm not a more successful dancer is okay because this other part of my life is so successful. Well, let's, let's be practical here. Okay, let's be let's be a little practical. I'm going to use some numbers because I, I do this a lot with my own management of my time. There are 168 hours in a week, and how many of those do you spend sleeping? Let's. Uh, do you want me to use you, or do you want me to use a fictional maybe 120? person? Okay, fair enough. That's quite a lot. Now, can we? Do you want me to use you, or would you rather I use a fictional person? You use a person that has like legitimate normal numbers. Okay, let's use a person with legitimate normal numbers. Let's say uh, experts would say roughly between six and eight hours, six and ten. I'm going to go for the average of eight, eight hours of sleep a day, right? Yeah, I, I, it's crazy that they're only sleeping eight hours, but okay. Yeah, uh, right, because, you know, if we could sleep so much more, it would just such a higher quality. So if we take away that, we're left with a hundred. Uh, actually, you know what? I wonder, there is a way for me to window capture this. Give me a second here, and I can I can actually change form. Oh, this is I'm I'm just I'm learning how to use this program, and it's just making my world so much better. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm really excited to do this because I, what I'm going to do is create a window capture of. Let's see here. I'm going to go in and edit. No, no, no. I don't. Can want to I edit. just say? Um, yeah. Something yeah, that go I ahead. really enjoy about you, Justin, is what's that? Uh, your when you think out loud, you're just sharing. You're just sharing your thinking process with with other people, and it's just so joyful. It's such a joyful thing to witness. <laughs> uh, great. I guess. Uh, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, good, good. I, I, no, I have nothing further to add to that. Okay. Okay. Okay, and we go okay, and then I go into presentation mode, and there we are. I think, I think I've done it. By golly, I think I've done it. I think now. you've done it! <laughs> okay. Oh, and now I'm going to add global Excel. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, there it is. Right on top. Move it down. I'm totally doing this live. It's so remarkable to me that I'm I'm able to just manipulate the show live while we're here. It it really really makes me happy actually. Order. I think you know I'm wondering what do you think in the podcast? Should I just like keep this droning uselessness in the conversation and like or edit it out? What are your thoughts? Um, I enjoy droning uselessness because, um, I, I expect it more than anything else, but, uh, maybe your listeners wouldn't. It's, I think, uh, for you as producer, it's up to you. Well, you know what? I think in some respects people will be very amused. Uh, minus the sum of, people are totally watching me work right now. It's really amusing to me. There it is. Okay. And then we'll just do that. All right. So average person sleeps 56 hours a week. Now, let's say you work. Okay. It doesn't matter what you work. Let's say you don't even love what you do. Let's, or let, yeah, we can suppose you don't love what you do or it's not your passion. Let's more specifically say your work is not your passion. Okay. Because maybe, maybe 
you're, you know, so it's non-passionate work. And, and that doesn't mean you don't love it. You might love, like you said, you love your work, right? But it's not necessarily your passion. And the average person uh, in North America and probably Australia too, 40 hours, is that reasonable? Yep. Okay, and I'm going to I, I'm going to add an additional hour of commuting time that's, each way. Okay, I think that's reasonable, right? Yep. Because some people, it's like ten minutes; they live right beside their work, and other people, they live really far, like two hours. But I'll just average it to an hour to get to work. Yeah. Cool. Okay, I'm now down to sixty-two hours. Now you need to factor in. Uh, you know, meal times, and although work accounts for, say, lunch, it doesn't account for breakfast and dinner, and then certainly doesn't account for the weekends. So, if we factor in meal times, so like eating and, you know, like life maintenance, I'll call yeah. that. So, that's like showering and all that kind of stuff. And we'll say at least three hours each day on the weekend, plus another uh, hour and a half, I'd say, Monday to Friday. Uh, every day. No, but like how twice a day, once a day? Oh, once a day for about 10 minutes. My showers are pretty quick. In the morning or in the evening? I do them in the morning. I shower in the morning. What's your toothbrushing routine? Uh, that's usually post-meal, morning and night. Okay. And do you floss once a day or twice a day? You know, I should floss twice a day, but right now once. I only floss once. I think that flossing more than once is a terrible idea. My dentist disagrees. He he really all my cavities were always between the teeth. Your dentist is a fool. He may be. So I think I said five times one point five plus six. So just life maintenance is thirteen point five hours. Yeah. Now I'm just estimating, but like let's say you have a romantic relationship of some kind. Okay? And if you if you're married, this is definitely less but if you're not like i mean married with children if you have children excuse me a moment here something is happening one of my skypes is i have two different skype accounts and one of them was going haywire so i signed out very good now <clears throat> a romantic relationship i would estimate to, be, to kind of maintain it and be healthy would be about 20 hours a week. That's crazy. I, I actually think that that might be low for some people. I don't even, and for know, others, I don't even know how you quantify that. I, I have no idea how you quantify that. Oh, you'd like me to know how I quantify it. Well, how many... Let's say you had a, a relationship, romantic relationship. How many date nights would you say you would need to have in a week? I have no idea. I have Three? absolutely no idea. I, I think it would depend entirely on the person. It would depend Oh, it totally does. I, like I said, we're making up a generic human being, you know, trying to average out what a generic person would do. I don't know. I, I don't, don't think anyone would ever satisfy this specific, you know, Are you talking list. about like a Westerner or like someone in a first world country or third world country or... I guess, I guess like I'd say... Uh, North American lifestyle that's I guess that's what I'm referring to that's kind of my reference point I don't really know what I know that Europeans for example have a shorter work week they only spend 30 hours at work not 40 right well I just so yeah romantic I the, think the, the hours are different can we remove romantic well I'm just supposing that a person if they had that it would take up time because yeah. uh, separate from friends Separate I mean, from I friends. Just, I, I, I don't know how you would quantify that. Uh, uh, like, I feel like the other things are really predictable, and this one is really unpredictable. Like, it's the... It, it really, it really is. Variable. But but if you if you average it out, I'd say if you're... If you, I mean, I just put it as relationship now. I've, I've taken your friendly amendment there. Um, but, you know, if it was just you and one person, I'd say three to four dates per week where you're just... It's just you and them would be reasonable for the average life right you know some okay. people it's like every day and other people it's once a week uh it's really really personal like really personal yeah but on average i'd say maybe 20 20 hours to a relationship okay but it could be just friends let's say you spend 20 hours a week with friends 
um, you know, family is certainly something that for a lot of people could take up the remainder of that time. I mean, I guess let's let's do this instead of appropriating hours because I think that there's a lot of debate in that. Let's let's remove the hours component and just look at the other categories. So you have relationship, you have family, and then th this last category I'll add, which is your passion. Now, you have 48.5 hours left that we haven't accounted for in the week. Now, we could put in a little bit of, let's say, personal time and say you're going to need at least 5 to 10 hours, even 10 hours to decompress. It leaves you with almost 40 hours to spend with family, relationships, and your passion. Right. Now... For some people, they, you know, you might feel a little compressed because if you look at this, uh, you, you're you're really rather limited, right? You've got, um, you know, once you've taken care of your body, you're eating in life. I mean, it doesn't really even factor in an exercise regimen. What if you what if you exercise one hour a day? That's another seven hours each week, right? Yep. Um, but I would I would factor that in with. You know, you might have to increase your, your personal and, and whatnot. But what I generally tell people is this. I actually take people through this. Uh, when they tell me they don't have a lot of time in their life, I say, you know, why not? Uh, why, why don't we look at how to balance this a little bit? So I'm just going to give a, a hypothetical here. I'm just going to look at what I think could be an example of a successful life, what someone might feel content with. Let's say they do spend uh, 15 hours a week on their passion, whatever that is. So 10 hours is personal. This is like alone time, reading, whatever, something that's watching just TV. them. Watching TV, absolutely. I actually combine, for example, I combine television with um, life maintenance. So if I'm cleaning my house, that's when I watch TV. Right. I, I don't sit and just dedicate and watch TV. I will combine TV with friends. Uh, you know, if I want to spend time with friends, and we'll, we'll watch a show together and have a conversation about the show. You know, so that kind of thing. If you're watching like another... Game of Thrones, you would never just watch it by yourself. It's, it's fun to watch certain programs with, with friends, but you may want to have time alone, so I factored that in. What that leaves you with is about 24 hours throughout a whole week, which is on average three hours a day, that you could spend with loved ones. Now, if you're in a family, some of these get, like if, if you have children, a lot of these get shifted. Like the personal time almost gets eliminated. They don't, you know, you talk with parents, they don't get a lot of time just for them. They, they find that they need to schedule a date night. You yep. know, just just to spend time with each other. Uh, so so there are certain things where priorities will move which is which. Like if you're in a serious relationship and you're in the beginning stages, I notice that a lot of my friends, they just disappear for a few months. I just don't see them. They're spending time developing and forming that new romantic relationship. And then they sort of come back and now they integrate back into the friendship again. Yeah. But, but what I'm saying is, that you can balance those hours. What I've left with right now in this hypothetical scenario is 24.5. But if we take out, or 23.5, if I take out those areas and we just say, okay, relationship, family, personal, and passion, you have 48 and a half hours a week that you can use to balance that. A lot of people, by the way, cut back on their sleep. They cut it back to six hours a day, which is a lot less, but that actually leaves them with 62 hours a week or on average uh, nine hours a day that they can spend on the, on the other aspects of their life, family, relationships, and so on. Like uh, I'm using, for example, a, a career woman who is also a mother full-time. Right. So she's at home taking care of the kids like, literally nine hours a day and also working eight hours a day. Yeah. I mean, obviously that life is not, you know, they, they might feel like they need some personal time or relationship time and, or friends time and they find a way to negotiate those in. But in, in the next course of your life, you're going to be juggling these various balls, these various things in your life. And I believe that if you focus your efforts into four areas, you're not going to achieve instant pure success in, in an area, you know, like, uh, and I mean by accolades and achievement, you're not going to achieve them in all four areas in the same time as if you just did one thing, right? 
I think that's true. But I think like if it, it, yeah, mm-hmm. go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, Dustin. Well, what I was going to say is when I did my master, for example, and I was finishing my master in physics, I it became a priority for me. And I basically put my relationship aside. I put passion aside. I was dancing 20 hours a week. I, I quit my dance lessons. I literally, like 16 hours a day, did my master and finished it in five months. When I was looking at almost a year or two years of work, it suddenly became important to me to finish, and I did in a very expedient time. But my life moved out of balance when I did that, and I needed to resume a balance when it was over. Right. You, If on average you set goals in your four areas, I believe that you will slowly achieve success in those areas over the net course of your life. You may not get it by tomorrow, but you'll get it over time. Over time, you will achieve the results you're looking for. And I think more importantly, you're going to feel content with where your life is as you're moving through it because you're making progress in the areas that are most important to you. I just feel like some the, the the nature of opportunity loss is that if you dedicate more time to a particular thing, then something else is is lying by the wayside, and it's mm-hmm. losing its kinetic potential. It's losing its its energy. It's losing its like like for example, the older that you get, the the less um, the less good your body will be at dancing. Like, it'll just wear away mm-hmm. and you'll be able to do less. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... And, all I mean, that's the nature of a choice, right? Is, yeah. is time wasted as a dancer because it's finite. That, I mean, that's the nature of a choice. You're, you're choosing one over another. And I think what's important is that you are happy with the choices you're making. And recognizing that they are choices. Yep. But I think you know, it's it's, it's not that there's thing. a bad choice or a good choice. You know, it's it's simply just a choice. And I think the important thing is to focus on that balance, that inner harmony of am I balancing all of my needs, all of the things that I want out of life? Am I getting all of those things with the choices that I'm currently making? Or do I need to cut back a little bit at work or cut back a little bit on my hobbies or cut back a little bit on relationships, you know, in order to achieve the results I'm looking for? Okay, well, I think my advice would be um, from a slightly different perspective. I think that that? if if I was going to be advising somebody, I'd say, um, you know, you can you can redefine for yourself what it means, what what you will be okay with. Um, So you've got your main pursuits and you care about them a lot. And then you've got other pursuits that you've decided are less important to you, but you still want them as part of your life. So you're going to do that community theater, you're going to dance 20 seconds or whatever it might be. And Mm -hmm. then um, you're going to have to be okay with that decision. You're going to have to acknowledge Mm -hmm. for yourself that I can't be everything. I can't stretch myself to be absolutely everything. And that's okay. Um, That's unnecessary pressure or unrealistic expectations that I'm placing on myself and Mm -hmm. I'm focusing too much on what I would like to be in the future and I'm forgetting about who I'd like to be today and Mm. who I'd like to be today is somebody that is doing this and that's okay. And it's okay to... I I think you've... I I completely agree with what you just said. I think you've really hit a good synopsis of saying I'm going to be happy with the choices that I make today and that's real contentment that's what it is it's being happy with where you are being happy with your choices yeah and I think I think disappointment is fine I think that part of happiness is disappointment like Hmm. you well I, I don't know if that's really disappointment though is it I mean if you're happy with your choices you're not disappointed well I, I sort of mean it more in the sense of like you don't know what happiness is if you're always happy um because that's not happiness Mm. that's just uh, like happiness is defined by its opposite of unhappiness like well i i think that's a whole other discussion a philosophical discussion on on opposites right cool that's uh, fair enough we'll leave that to one side um Mm -hmm. but i think that you know i think the disappointment and contentment um, as binaries, 
um, I think that it's it's difficult to understand what being content uh, is, or it's difficult to understand what you know what makes you happy unless you know what doesn't make you happy and what a not feeling happy feels like. So I think that like, uh, say like an example would be. Um, you're you're at your job and you've you've screwed up and you feel really really bad about screwing up and you feel like you're doing a terrible job and the fact of the matter is what makes you a good employee in my opinion is not the fact that you will never make mistakes but that you'll be able to understand when you've made a mistake acknowledge it and learn from it and become better be better at your job um and that's the way that I view an idea of um, of opportunity. It's it's not about never letting go of opportunities. It's not about being able to do everything. About keeping perfect equilibrium. It's about sometimes leaning really heavily to one side and having a passion and feeling really really good about that and knowing that you won't be able to do some other stuff. And that being really, really sad, and that might make you really sad, but that's okay. It's okay to feel that way. It's normal and it's good because it's saying to me, you know, this is something that I've given up and it's made me quite unhappy, but the thing that I've given it up for is making me really happy, and that's okay. I think we've really pinpointed the distinction between contentment and happiness. Because what you described, I would say, is contentment. Contentment is not about being happy all the time. Contentment is about feeling a sense of peace with your choices. Versus happiness, which comes and goes. You can be content and unhappy at the same time. An example, you know, Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning described the process of being in a concentration camp and that he was still able to find purpose in his life by choosing to live in a dignified way when he had absolutely no earthly pleasures whatsoever. Yeah. Not even a name. He was a number. He had no, you know, he, but he was able to find purpose in his life by, by deciding that dignity would be he would choose to live dignified and that was his best self that he could be and so he was going to live with that sense of best self yeah and so even though he's unhappy he was able to find purpose and contentment fulfillment in living his life to the best that he could but i think like what i what i would like more focus on when when you're talking about this stuff like from mm-hmm. uh um, uh, from an um, I- engagement sort of standpoint is that I'd, I'd like to sort of hear what you have to say on it being okay to feeling sad sometimes and feeling like a failure sometimes or feeling like you're not pursuing something that you should be pers- that you feel like you would like to pursue but that you've decided you don't have enough mm. time for I, I see. So I, I think perhaps you got the impression that I was suggesting if you feel unhappy, you should find a way to feel happy. Yeah. And and what I'm suggesting is that if you feel unhappy, you feel unhappy. I, I don't I don't suppose to project that you should ever not feel what you feel. If you lose a loved one in your life, you're going to feel sad more than likely, and you're going to miss them. And the there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a feeling. It's a feeling is something you have. It's not who you are. Yep. What I'm talking about is the condition of presence, of being present and being who you are, being your best self. And that's separated from what you feel. So when I say, for example, that I am happy with my level of, of professional dancing because I've found a way to define it where I can perform my dancing and be content with that. Sure, if I somebody came to me and said, we'd like you to be a professional dancer for this X company, I would probably do it, but only for about six months, a year. I don't think I would do it forever. So you're content with your dancing, but you're not happy with your dancing. 
Well, I guess I guess we could say that. Yeah, like the thing is, even if I were offered the opportunity, if someone, you know, genie went poof and said, I'd, "I'll make you a professional dancer," I would enjoy it. But I know I would enjoy it like a vacation. Yeah. I would enjoy it like in that sense and I've been able to distinguish that when you suddenly figure out that something is more of a vacation than a lifelong commitment it makes a huge difference to yourself I was I was unhappy for a very long time when I was unable to separate being a professional dancer from all the other things that I wanted to be and when I was able to resolve that when I was able to say well which one do I really truly want to pursue and be content with making that choice. How did you make that decision? What were what were the thing? What was the the clincher for you? That's a great question. I would say that the the clincher for me came in the realization that I did not need to be a professional dancer in that traditional sense. I did not need to be that for the rest of my life I made the choice I think it was when I finally made the choice when I said you know when I'm a, I'm a motivational speaker if I perform on stage for even 20 seconds that's good and I'm, I'm happy with that that is good enough like we said earlier happy enough is happy when I realized that I would be happy with that and that that was going to be my choice I suddenly realized I don't have to be a professional dancer huh so I can continue to improve my abilities just because I enjoy it and I can incorporate it into my motivational speaking and whenever I, whenever it so, suits. And, and that's happy enough for me. And as soon as I made that distinction, it was the act of making the choice, I would say, that separated me from my unhappiness. My unhappiness came from not making the choice. Mm-hmm. When I sat there and said, I'm going to have it all. I'm going to be a professional dancer. I'm going to motivational speak. And I'm going to, to work full time as a teacher. And, I'm go- and you know, I, I was juggling these things as if I was going to achieve them in these massive extremes all at the same time. And when I made the choice, that's when the contentment and happiness came to me. So happiness can sometimes be letting go of something that you love because you know that you you couldn't do it to the standard that you would like to do it and so uh instead of pursuing it in an empty or um or um unfulfilling way you'd rather pursue it in a way that you can engage with it in a way that it's fun for you and satisfying for you but you know that it won't be to the level that you would have liked I, I think I think that that could be one way. I, I think if I were to simplify it a little easier, happiness and contentment with an opportunity lost can come from accepting when you've made a choice. Hmm. I think what people struggle with in opportunity loss, and, and maybe it took us an hour and a half to reach this point, Mm-hmm. But, but it, it, I feel a little excited because I feel like we're really close to almost a sense of agreement. I don't, I'm scared to say it, but maybe we might agree now when I say making a choice and letting go. You will feel a sense of loss. You will say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm choosing to not be a professional dancer. I'm choosing that life. And, and when you okay can say, and that. that's okay... As soon as you can say, and that's okay, I think that that becomes a way of living in a content way with making choices. And that's, and and I think that the the personal, the the, something that we couldn't possibly articulate here, that, you know, would be based purely on one's personal situation, is how to get to that point, is how to be okay with that choice. And you know what it is about it uh, that 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 is causing you that comfort but that, that yeah i mean it's just it's i think something. i think the freedom of it someone had called me i had to disconnect that there that's what that was um it's a, i think the freedom in making a choice 
is in acting on that freedom and being content with making that choice. Some people feel like, okay, uh, I'll give you a, a little more of an extreme example. I have work and I have family and I'm having a really hard time having both. Yeah. And some people feel like they have to choose one or the other. Or even worse is when you have to choose between people. Yeah. Well, I think that right? there's some... I think I lost you for a second. Tali, you still there? Subject things there. So, so you can dance. Yeah. So I think that there's some objective and subjective things there, like where with family, it's it's more objective because it's not about how satisfied you are with the way that you are with your family. It's about how satisfied your family is with being with you as well. Yes. There's certainly the give and give, and give side of it. You're giving, so they're giving, and are you both happy? Dance or not. Dancing right. Isn't corporeal. Yeah. So, for example, if you have to choose between family and friends, or family and friends and a relationship, yeah, and you're you're juggling those three on top of work, on top of passion, and you're having a hard time making a choice. I think it's just recognizing that there is only so much time in the week, and when you make a choice, you're making it, and it's the act of making the choice and letting go of the other one. Whether you find a way, like we've mentioned many ways that you could do that, whether you do that by redefining your level of success or by simply letting it go and saying, you know, that's just not that important to me. It's not yeah. as important to me as something else. And I think if you can make that choice and make that distinction and be happy with yourself for having made that choice, that's yeah. really the secret to managing opportunity lost, that in life you're going to make choices. And although, like I've said, and I, I don't know if I sound like I've contradicted my original point, although I feel like my original point maybe has evolved since the beginning of this conversation. Sometimes you can integrate. I, like I said, I believe anything's possible. So you can integrate all of the great things you want in your life. But at some points, you might feel like you have to make a choice. And when you do, you need to find a way to be content with that choice. I, I like I like what I'm hearing now. I feel like we're in a good place. I feel like we're in a good yeah. place in the conversation. I I I agree. I feel like I feel like viewers will uh, you know will will respond both ways to the idea that and we, we, you know we talk about them like they're not a part of this conversation. Do you think we should talk directly to them? Mm, I I don't know. I it feels a little. I, I mean, if they if people engage with us actively, like if people sent us messages or emails or something, and ask yeah. us concrete questions, I feel like I could like engage with them. But otherwise, I I prefer to pretend it's just you and I talking. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, we'll stick with that for now. It's a format that's working. So back to the third person them. Yeah. If 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 someone is is listening in and they and they feel. Like they're stuck between making two what they would call impossible choices, and I don't know which one, then I would say to them, you have two solutions, two possible routes, if I can make it a binary sort of thing. Yeah. You, well, I guess there's three. We'll make it trinary. One is you continue to be unhappy with this impossible choice, and just don't make one. That's always an option. You don't have to make the choice. You'd, that's one. Another is you make the choice and acknowledge that it's a choice and you've chosen your priority. Like you're at dinner with this beautiful person and then you realize you've got this other commitment. And do you leave that commitment or do you leave the person? And you've got to make a choice. So you make one and then you accept the responsibility of that choice and live with it. Yeah. That's another one. And you can be content. The third one is the one I initially suggested as well, which is find a way to integrate both. Maybe you invite that beautiful person to that opportunity that you have to go to. Yeah, so like your dentist appointment. Right, so you know, you've got this dentist appointment. Actually, it's a really great, this is a really great point. Um, a really great example. I had a chiropractor appointment earlier this week. Sorry, Doc. And uh, I missed my appointment. And you know where I was during the appointment? Uh, doing back-breaking labor? No, <laughs> that would be so ironic. I was in the parking lot on a phone call. And I chose the phone call over the appointment. I was faced with a decision. I, I really, I was, in a, I was in a phone call. Was it a, a business, business phone, phone call? call or a relationship it was. phone call? Or? 
it was a business phone call, but the person with whom I was speaking, I valued them and I didn't want to displace them or move them. I made a choice. I said, I'm going to stay on this call. I'm not going to move them. So it's almost and, like you turned off your health burner and right. you turned up your relationship burner. Sure. And well, I guess in this one, career burner, right? And then career I went in. Burner. Yeah. So I, I went into the office hoping that I wasn't so late that I missed my appointment. I was 25 minutes late. And I asked the doctor or the, the clerk at the desk, I said, you know, I'm sorry I'm late. I didn't bother giving the reason. I just said, I'm sorry I'm late because I'd made my choice. And they said, I'm sorry you're not able to be seen today. And I said, okay, let's reschedule. And we rescheduled. And that's it. It's not like I said no to my health forever. I just deferred it to another day. Yeah, but your back probably is getting got worse by then, right? Well, that's that's a matter of choice. I had decided, you know, which one was better for me and then lived with the choice. But I made the choice freely. I didn't feel an obligation to the doctor and I didn't feel an obligation to the person on the phone. I just made a distinction between the two which one I wanted. And I and I lived with it. Yeah. And, and I owned up to the responsibility of that choice. I said, I'm sorry. I said, please tell the doctor I'm sorry. You know, and, and I'm coming back in a, I think we set an appointment for two weeks from now. Yeah. I, I still, yeah, I, I still, I find it very hard to engage with your, um, with your utopian uh, equilibrium kind of idea. Oh, well, the utopian equilibrium solution in that context would have been me taking the business call into the chiropractor appointment i i mean i didn't even know i didn't even know what that would ent- i guess that's one way of thinking about it i had it on my bluetooth this crossed my mind i'm like you can have both and here was the both i had it on bluetooth i could have gone in i would have said just a moment i'm going to put you on hold put them on hold quickly talked with the nurse because you're waiting in the doctor's office anyway right yeah so i just said okay i'll tell the nurse i'm here then go back onto the call, and as soon as I, I and I would let my the person I was on the phone with, I'd say, "Hey, so I've got an appointment that could come up any moment now. I won't know when, so if it does, I might have to let you go." And then I would have been able to basically extend that the call went and only twenty minutes over. I probably would have been waiting in the doctor's office that whole time. Yeah, I really, I really could have had both. I could have had both my doctor's appointment and the call. However, I made a choice. I made a choice to pick just one over the other instead of choosing both but i realized that both was also a possibility for me and i had even imagined and invented a way in which i could have had both but because yeah but that pursuit of equilibrium did it wasn't the major um the major thinking at that time for you it really was the um it was about choosing so yeah well and like i said i i it was it was one of three choices. Choose neither. Just try and do both somehow. But not really. Or choose both and integrate them somehow. Or choose one or the other. And I, I chose one or the other in that instance. In other instances, like let's say I'm on a phone call with my mother and I need to go grocery shopping. And the call's pretty good. I'm having a pretty good conversation, but it's not so personal that I have to be dedicated to just the call. I then maybe get in my car and go grocery shopping and maintain the conversation with my mother. It's a great idea. I do it all the time. Right. So you can integrate certain things together and sometimes you, you don't. And that's a choice you make. So you, you can sort of balance things and, and, and put them together. But you don't, you don't always have to. And sometimes someone might be like, hey, it really annoys me that you grocery shop while we talk. Can we just talk? Yeah, that's totally. I mean, I, I really need to go to the toilet now. But I'm, I'm also engrossed in this conversation and I want to continue it. And so right. I'm actively making a choice whether I'm going to pee in my bed. I mean, if you really needed to, we could always take another break. But I feel like we're reaching near the conclusion of our show anyway for today. Okay, cool. Uh, so l- l- let's let's say that the conclusion then 
if I were to reach one, is uh, sort of summarize where we reached with this conversation on opportunity loss, is in life you're going to be faced with choices. You're going to be faced with options. And we can make it, let's say, binary, but really it's more complex than that. You're faced with many choices of many things. And you need to choose which of those you can integrate into your life and which of those you might need to segregate and then pick one or the other. Yeah, and I completely agree with you because I really need to go to the toilet. Right, and so whether you take one or the other or both is your choice. And so long as you are happy making that free choice and you accept the responsibility and the potential losses, you know, you might be sad doing one and happy doing another, and that's okay. Literally could not agree with you more. Literally, or is this just like a convenient sort of thing? This is like a like an emergency thing. <laughs> Look, you know what? Um, if you want, Tali, I, I think we've reached the end of our program anyway. I'm going to do a little spiel about how people can sign on to the, the newsletter and whatnot, and I'll, I'll let you go, and then we'll reconnect after the show. Okay, fantastic. I'll check Yeah, I, I wanted to, th- of course, and I wanted to thank you, Tali, again for joining us on We Win oh, with God, you're T1. torturing me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll catch you later, buddy. See you, Justin. Okay. Ciao. And so, I'm now going to just quickly wrap up. You can sign on to our newsletter, timeconsultinginc.com slash newsletter, or you can check us out and email if you have any questions for myself or Tolly at wewin at timeconsultinginc.com. We're going to be resuming some normal programming next week. I think Monday's show, I'm going to air it at 8.30 anyway, I hope. Uh, uh, yeah, that's that's sort of my intent. Just pay attention to our Facebook. It's uh, Time Consulting. Uh, I think that's the Facebook link. Yeah, Time Consulting. Facebook.com. Let's just quickly take a peek here. It might be Facebook.com slash Time Consulting Inc. Let's see here. If you just look up Time Consulting Inc., yes, that is it, facebook.com slash Time Consulting Inc., you will find us, and we certainly post our things there. We also post it at www.timeconsultinginc.com. There's a little Twitter feed where you can follow us on Twitter. You just go hashtag Time Consulting Inc., and you will find us, and we'll let you know more about the programs coming forward. I can let you know for certain that the upcoming program should be on Monday, definitely on Tuesday. We'll have another program on the scientific laws of success, and and we'll be discussing tension. And wouldn't that be exciting? Tension. Very exciting topic. Looking forward to talking with you then. Again, thank you for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you next time.